How are we? Are we on? We are? Oh, we are. Oh, you set a timer for me. Thank you. I'll put this back. Well, I guess I don't need to put it back. I'll just keep it up here. Okay. We're fine. I promise. We're fine. Um, welcome to Bible study. I'm so excited. Are y'all excited to get back into it? Yeah, and for some of you, this is your first time, and uh, we have been praying for you for a good long time. Before you even knew you were going to sign up for this study, we've been praying for you, and I'm just really, really excited. I will tell you, and then I'm going to pray, but I will tell you, I started studying the letters of John almost a year ago. And so I have been, like, I've had all this percolating in me now for so long that it's really good that they set a timer or we might just be here till tomorrow. And I don't want to do that. I don't want to do that to you. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love you so much, Lord. And it's just an honor and a privilege, Lord, to be here with so many friends, all of us just eager to hear a word from you. And so, Lord, we do, we ask you to speak. And Lord, we ask you to speak to us clearly We ask you to move in our hearts. Lord, I know uh, so many of us came in frazzled and hurried and rushed. And so, Lord, I just ask that as we each take a big collective deep breath, you would enable us to exhale out all of the worries and hardships and frustrations of the day, Lord, and that we would literally be able to breathe your spirit in and exhale our anxieties out and breathe your peace in. God, you're amazing. You're mighty and you're matchless. You know each one of us by name and you call us your own. It's a privilege to be in your presence, Lord. Thank you so much for gathering us together as we eagerly open up your word, Lord God, and listen to what you would have to say. And so, Lord, may these words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer, as we all say, amen. So I know a lot of you, and to those of you I haven't met yet, um, I will just tell you a little something about myself. About this time last year, I stepped down from a 23-year career, and I took a position at Dallas Theological Seminary. And so I went from a high pressure job where I had to get up at 3.30 in the morning and it was go, 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 go. And then all of a sudden, you know what happened to me this summer? It's the craziest thing. Do I have anyone here who's a teacher or who works in academia? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, academic people. What do y'all get that none of the rest of us get if, if we're in the corporate sphere? Summer. I got a Summer. I got, I got a summer. It was amazing. I can't remember the last time I had a summer. Yes, I can. I was 21 and about to graduate college, but I, I had a summer and it was so fun. I have really enjoyed this laid back pace. It's a different world for me though. And what's been kind of interesting is that there are some people that I, that I had been really, really friendly with, first name basis with, and now they're, they're all my bosses. <laughs> So that's always kind of an interesting place to be. And then last week, I had the most intimidating thing happen to me. I get to the office, I open up my email, and I have an email from the office of the president. Because when you're the president of a seminary, you don't have to send your own emails. You have people for that. And so his people reached out to me because I don't have people, and I... I get social anxiety. A lot of you already know this about me. I I put my foot in my mouth so often I should just dip it in chocolate and be done with it and enjoy it while it's in there. Um, And so I just didn't open it right away. I just took my time and I just like kind of pretended it wasn't there for a little while. And I don't know if I was trying to play it cool um, with the president of the seminary or not. I don't know what I was doing. But finally, my curiosity got the better of me and I opened this email And the president of the seminary has requested that my husband and I join him at his table at a gala a week from Monday. Well, don't be too impressed. It's not because I'm an impressive person. It's because it's a radio thing and I used to work in radio. So it's not, that's the only reason why. But still, right now, like now I'm like really preoccupied with 
what do you wear to a gala like this? And I, you know, I mean, gosh, I've got to be on my best behavior and I'm not so much worried about myself, but some of you know Mike. And so that's just frightening to put him at a table with these like dignitaries and high ups and I just don't know what he'll ever say and I don't know what I'll say. But I will tell you this, I, I emailed my husband and I was like, OMG, what are we gonna do? And he writes back, he's like, cool, let's go. And I'm like, ah. And then he writes back, he's like, well, are we going? And I'm like, are we going? You don't say no when the president of the seminary requests you. Like, do you even, is that an option? It's, I don't think it's an option. So we're going to this gala and I'm very nervous. And I hope he never hears this. But when someone like a president of anything really requests your time or your attention, I mean, you just do it, right? You just do it. And we all have these people in our lives. We all have these people where when the phone rings, you know, we've all got our people where we're like, "Mm, check you later. But there's some people, you know, there's some people where when they call, it's not only do we answer the phone, but like we take a second and we're like, hello, hello. And, and, you know, if you want to act like you're really important, do this. Please hold for Rebecca. This is Rebecca. So we all have these people. And if you, if you, um, you know, maybe it's a, a family friend or, or maybe it's um, a boss or a CEO or a, of a company or I don't know, maybe your phone rings and you hear, please hold for Brad Pitt. Well, I'm answering. I'm answering for Brad Pitt. Here's where I'm going with this. We're all here tonight on a Tuesday night, right? We are in a church on a Tuesday night. We are sacrificing our time. Um, We could be doing a whole lot of other things and a whole lot of other people would say these are more fun than a Bible study. We could be chilling on the couch watching Netflix. We could be going out to dinner with the girls. We could be, um, you know, refereeing our children as they fight like demons. That's probably just me. Uh, But there's a whole bunch of other things we could be doing. But we have chosen to be here for a Bible study and it's for one reason. We all, I'm assuming, at least agree that there's a higher power, right? I mean, there might be some skeptics in the audience, and if, if that's the case, I'm so glad you're here. But for the most part, most of us are probably here because we believe that God is real and we believe that he has something to say. Well, God is the king of the universe. He is the creator God, creator of heaven and earth and everything in it. And this high and mighty, awesome and matchless sitting outside of time and space God is also very personal. He can fit down into our very DNA and he is requesting an audience with us. And I think about how many times in my own life I have had some spare time and thought, you know, I could could read scripture or, or I could see what people are doing on Twitter. But the God of the universe is requesting an audience with us. And I think that's really cool. I think that's really cool. And so we are here tonight because we believe that God has something to say to each one of us. And since we are going to study three books of the Bible in the course of nine weeks, and I say that like it's really impressive. I don't know if any of you have looked at 2nd and 3rd John yet. They're like, we've got the letters of the Bible, and then we've got the postcards. These are two of the postcards. Super short. We're condensing them into one night. I feel bad about that, but it's what has to be done. Um, But we're studying three books of the Bible in the course of this study. And so that tells me, since you're here and you paid for the workbook, that you believe believe that you believe that there is some good that we can glean from this book, right? So thank you. I love a responsive audience. Um, and so here's what, here's, here's what I want to impress on you more than anything else. This is eight weeks. We've got eight weeks after tonight, okay? Eight weeks after tonight, nine weeks total. I'm going to ask you for the duration of this nine week period, and you don't have to do this because I'll never know, but I'm going to ask you to really give God a chance. And when you read some of the same things over and over, I'm going to ask you to keep muscling through because sometimes it's in reading the most familiar words when we ask God to highlight new things for us, we see things that we have never seen before. And so I'm going to ask, I'm just going to ask that you would endure to the end 
I think that these are some of the most precious verses in all of scripture that we're going to be walking through. And I'm gonna ask you to give God a chance at least four days a week for the next nine weeks. I'm not asking for seven. If you wanna spread the homework out over seven days in a week, you can. But I think that if you would commit to four days a week, sitting down, opening the Bible and answering the questions, I believe that you will hear from God. You will hear from God. I want to read a verse to you. This is one of my favorite verses. And I'm going to read it in the New International Version. It's Psalm 25, 14. And it says, the Lord confides in those who fear him. What does fear mean? It means to those who hold God, um, who who behold him with a, a state of awe and reverence. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. And so if you are one of those people that trusts in the Lord, the Lord wants to confide in you. Now think of the people that you confide in and think of the kinds of things that you confide. That's what the Lord wants to do to you, for you, say to you. That's the right way to say it. He has things And I know this with all my heart. He has things that he wants to say to just you. He has things to say to you that are only going to make sense to you because no one knows your heart like Jesus does. No one knows your hurts like Jesus does. No one knows your insecurities like Jesus does. No one knows what you're up against like Jesus does. Jesus knows the hurts you can't remember that cause the behavior you can't explain. God has something to say to you. And the reason I'm so excited and passionate for you to get into these words is because God's not gonna give your word to me. He's waiting for you. He wants your undivided attention. And so he's, I hope and pray that the Lord gives me something to give you each week. I think he will. I trust him. He has in the past. But what I'm really after is that intimacy, that alone time when it's just you and the Lord, because that's where the deepest ministry is always going to happen. That's where you're gonna get the greatest revelation when it's just you in the quiet with your Bible open working through the books that we're studying. And so whatever it is he wants to tell you, he's not gonna tell me. He's not gonna tell Lauren, our women's minister. He's not gonna tell our pastors. He's waiting on you. And so before we get into the meat of things, what I wanna do is I wanna get into, I wanna, I wanna just say a little bit about the Bible. Um, a good place to start is what is the Bible? Well, for nearly 4,000 years, think about that. For nearly 4,000 years, first Jews, then Jews and Christians have believed that the Bible contains the inspired words of God, the, the sacred scriptures. The Bible is one book. It's a book. And because I have the large print, my book is really big. Um, But it's a library. This is a library of 66 books written by over 40 different authors. It was written over a span of uh, just over 1,500 years. It was written on three different continents in three different languages. But when you read this book, one of the things that you are going to find is that it is one seamless unified story. And every word in it points to Jesus. So Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible between 1446 and 1406 BC. He wrote those first five books while the Israelites were wandering around in the wilderness. And then John, the guy we're talking about tonight, wrote the last book of the Bible, Revelation, around 95 AD. And that's it. That's it. And for thousands and thousands of years around the globe, people have believed that God inspired every word. Now, I want to ask you a question. And until we can settle this question, there is no reason for us to go a second further. How can we know? How can we know that the Bible is trustworthy? How can we know that this is God's actual word? Why are we so convinced that it is true? This is a really important question for us to ponder. Sociologists today tell us that we are living in a post-truth era. Does that resonate with anybody? What do you think of when I say post-truth? Truth is irrelevant. And it's, it's, truth is irrelevant, but it's also very malleable, right? Like, like 
truth can be shaped and formed and your truth might not look like my truth and your truth might not look like her truth and Retha's truth might not look like Melinda's truth. I mean, truth is, it, it's just what we make of it, right? That's what the majority of Americans believe these days. And so that means that our barometer for truth now as a society is no longer what is observable, measurable, and provable. Instead, we believe that truth is what feels right. Truth is just what feels right to me. And, and there's a couple little things that make me nervous about that. First of all, is I am 48 years old. I don't need to explain what that means, means to you, but I will tell you my core temperature has gone up by about 10 degrees. And I will tell you, I might feel very strongly about something one minute and five minutes later, I'm on the other side of that spectrum. Anybody else? I would venture to say that at least my feelings are not always the best measure for making sound and rational decisions. Not the best, not always. And so what I want to do is I want to give you five reasons that we can trust God's word because the Bible not only claims very boldly, very brazenly to be true, but the Bible tells us that God is the source of all truth, that all truth comes from the Lord. So we're going to count them down quickly. And I had so many more than five, but I, I got to... I, I, too much information is always my problem. It's never not enough. Okay, so here's number five. I love this. No credible historian in the history of history has ever denied or denies today that Jesus is a historical figure. That is across the board agreed upon. Now, you've got some, and some, you know, you've got, you've always got the fringe, but I am telling you, Practiced, seasoned, credible historians say without a shadow of a doubt that if there is anything we can count on this, in this world, it is that Jesus is real. He was a real person who lived around 2,000-ish years ago in the region of Galilee and that he was very well known for miracles, okay? That's what history tells us, and no one denies that. And here's exhibit A. This is so fun. Okay, look at your calendar, we have divided time neatly into two eras, haven't we? We got BC over here, and we got AD over here. Anybody know what BC stands for? Before Christ. And AD? Anno Domini, which means the year of our Lord. Okay, so even those who don't believe that Jesus is the Son of God cannot deny that not only did he exist, but his existence was so profound and the ripple effect so great that it literally split time in two. It split time in two. And I know today that we're saying before common era and common era, but I'm telling you, BC, AD, Jesus had such an impact on the world that it split the calendar in two. Number four, extra biblical writings. What does that mean? Extra meaning outside of or apart from, outside of the Bible. So the Bible is actually not the only ancient book that talks about Jesus. You can find writings on Jesus in plenty of other places. Um, Flavius Josephus, I know you've all read him, right? <laughs> He was born a few years after Jesus died. He was the son of a very respected Jewish priest, and he himself became a Pharisee. He was a well-known scholar and a historian. He visited Rome in 64 AD, and he fell in love with the culture and eventually became a military leader for the Romans. Um, they asked him to write a history of his people. So he wrote three books that are, that are very helpful in understanding first century Jewish and Roman life. And this is what he says, about Jesus said. Now there was about this time Jesus, a wise man, if it be lawful to call, to call him a man, for he was a doer of wonderful works. Okay, he wrote in Greek and the word translated to wonderful could also be translated miraculous. A teacher of such men as receive the truth with pleasure. He drew over to him both many of the Jews and many of the Gentiles. He was the Christ, which means Messiah. 
And when Pilate, at the suggestion of the principal men amongst us, had condemned him to the cross, those that loved him at the first did not forsake him, for he appeared to them alive again the third day, as the divine prophets had foretold these events and 10,000 other wonderful things concerning him. And the tribe of Christians, so named from him, are not extinct at this day. Isn't that cool? We got another one. Publius Tacitus. He is known as the greatest Roman historian of the first and second centuries. He was also a senator. And in one of his books, he wrote about the great fire of Rome and how Nero, Emperor Nero, who's crazy, blamed it on the Christians. And when he referred to Jesus, he called him the Christ, meaning the Messiah. Okay, number three, since Josephus mentioned it, let's go ahead and talk about fulfilled prophecy. A good chunk of the Old Testament is made up of prophetic writings. And these are the books that are usually called by a name. You've got Isaiah and Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel, and then the 12 that no one ever reads. Um, Those are the prophets, and those are filled with predictions and proclamations. But... um, There was an author and a scholar from the 1800s, and he made this his life work. He was a Jew who had converted to Christianity, and he counted, I have not double-checked him, but he counted 456 prophecies in the Old Testament that we would call messianic, which means predictive or patterned after a future Messiah. So they either predict something about Jesus or they established a pattern that Jesus fulfilled. 456. How many do you think Jesus has fulfilled? I'm going to give you a hint so you don't yell this out. It's not all of them, but it is over 300. Over 300. Well, but then there's 156 that he didn't fulfill yet. Because the ones that have not been fulfilled yet, you know what they all have in common? They're about his return. They're about his second coming. He has fulfilled every single prophecy that was written about his birth, life, ministry, death, resurrection, and ascension. Every single one. And the Old Testament was complete well over 200 years before Jesus was ever born. Yes, we can prove that. Isn't that amazing? Fulfilled prophecies. Oh, I want to show you just a few. And I'm going to zip through this. Um, Micah said he would be born in Bethlehem. Matthew, Luke, and John agreed that he was. Zechariah said he would enter Jerusalem on a donkey. Uh, That is found in Matthew and Luke. Uh, The Psalms say he would be betrayed by a friend. Anybody remember Judas? Matthew and John both recount that. Zechariah said he would also be sold for 30 pieces of silver. Guess how much? Matthew tells us Judas sold him for 30 pieces of silver, born of a virgin, crucified, hands and feet pierced, raised from the dead. Check, check, check. That's just seven. There's over 300. He fulfilled all of them. Number two, Jesus performed many miracles in front of thousands of eyewitnesses. These are not rumors of miracles. You know how we know that? This is very provocative to me. I would think that if the enemies of Jesus wanted to like downplay him and minimize him and make his impact not so great, that they would just kind of like negate everything he did. And they'd be like, yeah, he taught some stuff, but that was it, nothing else. None of them denied he did miracles. They all talked about his miracles. All of them talked about his miracles. They just attributed them to Satan. See, if I was trying to undercut someone, I would probably, I mean, they lied to crucify him. I'd probably just continue the motif of that lie, but they couldn't. Why? There were too many eyewitnesses. The vast majority of the New Testament is written on eyewitness testimony. Eyewitness testimony. He gave sight to the blind, raised people from the dead, fed approximately 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two fish, turned around, fed another 4,000 out of seven loaves and three fish, all in front of thousands of eyewitnesses. And then the last one I'm gonna give you is this, the blood of the martyrs. What do I mean by that? I want you to think about this. I want you to think about it very logically. Everybody in this room has told a lie, white lie, big lie. We've all told, we've all fudged the truth, okay? Um, And people lie for all kinds of reasons, but 
most of the time, it's because they get something out of it, right? Like the fish was this big. Look what a good fisherman I am, right? We typically, when we fudge the truth, we do it to make ourselves look better or to get away with something or to cover up something we're ashamed of. But it benefits us or we wouldn't do it. Now, when the lie, when the benefit of the lie becomes minimized and the cost of maintaining the lie outweighs that benefit, what do we tend to do? We tend to back down. I see it with my kids all the time. Oh, really? Because your text message said this and you know that if you lie, oh, no, 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 you're right, you're right, you're right, you're right. You see, once the cost of the lie gets too high, we back down. Every single one of the disciples who turned apostles died for their faith. And I'm telling you, like we glamorize Jesus today, y'all. He was a poor, homeless, ragtag Jewish rabbi who was crucified in the most shameful way in an honor, shame driven society. There was no honor in hitching your wagon to Jesus in any circle except his. No benefit to that. No benefit to that, the first 300 years of Christianity. People looked down on Christians. In fact, because of some, of some kind of confusing teachings of Jesus, a lot of people thought they were unclean cannibalistic cult members. Becoming a Christian always meant getting excommunicated from the synagogue and likely cut off from your family if they were not believers. It brought no honor, no wealth, no power, no sex, no drugs, no rock and roll, none of that. And yet every single one of his disciples, except John, chose death. And every single one of them had the chance to recant and say, say, just, just joking. Please don't crucify me. Right? None of them back down. None of them back down. And for 2000 years, people have continued to die for Jesus. Every single one of the apostles, and uh, except for John, and many of the early church fathers were crucified, torn apart by wild animals in the arena, drawn and quartered, burned at the stake. None of them backed down. There's so much more evidence. We've got 2,000 years of church history. We've got an empty tomb. We've got the fact that no one found his body ever and the ongoing testimony of Jesus's work in the lives of those around us. But we do need to talk about John or we will never get out of here. Um, Okay, so the letters of John are found in the New Testament toward the very, 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 very back of your Bible. If you get to Jude or Revelation, you went too far. The New Testament goes like this. We've got the Gospels first, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and they tell the story of Jesus. Acts, the Acts of the Apostles, tells the story of the church. The letters of Paul are like a Bible study on the Gospels. They are Paul's commentary on the Gospels. And then we have the general epistles or the general letters. An epistle is a seminary word for a letter. Um, Those are just all the letters that were not written by Paul. Like we've got Peter and James and the book of Hebrews and John's letters. Um, And those are all commentaries on the Gospels. And then we have Revelation, which is wacky, and it's about the future, and we're not going to worry about it tonight. So who wrote John's letters. I will give anybody an A who wants to yell it out. Oh, how did you know? How did you know? You're so smart. A plus. Okay. So the best evidence we have is that, and there are some people who will disagree, but the best evidence we have points to John the apostle who also wrote the gospel according to John. Now, after Jesus died, John stayed in Jerusalem and he became one of the founding fathers of uh, the Jerusalem church and evidence from the early church fathers, those are the people who are over the churches right after the apostles. Uh, they suggest that he moved to Ephesus in 67 AD. What do we know about John? So John was one of the original 12, one of Jesus's band of brothers. And he was like, you know, we tend to think of him as this really kind of old guy with his big long beard. He might've been 16 or 17 
when he followed Jesus. He was definitely a teenager. He was young. Um, he had a brother named James, and their nicknames were the Sons of Thunder. They were troublemakers, all right? Uh, John was one of the three disciples closest to Jesus and what we call part of Jesus's inner three. He was on the mountain with Peter and James in, in um, the gospel accounts. This is called the Mount of Transfiguration. And um, what happened there was they went up on top of this mountain and all of a sudden, like a cloud came down and then Jesus was glowing white and he was brighter than the sun and Moses and Elijah were there with them. And Peter's like, oh, I'm freaking out, Jesus, I'll make you a tent. And Jesus is like, chill. And then they hear the voice of God. I'm paraphrasing. <laughs> That's what the original Greek says, chill. Um, and then we hear God, they hear God the Father say from heaven, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. I always chuckle at that because um, all, you know, John and Peter both had kind of a reputation for putting their foot in their mouths. And so they're, uh, God tells them to listen to Jesus. John was pretty legit, though. He was the only one of the disciples who stayed when Jesus was being crucified. He was the only one who stayed at the foot of the cross and didn't cut and run. John most likely wrote his letters between 90 and 95 AD. So these are some of the latest works that we have that are in what we call the canon of scripture. Canon means authorized approved books. By the time John wrote his letters, he had seen the church rise and explode going all the way to Rome, which for them was the ends of the earth. Um, he had heard reports of Christians undergoing terrible persecution at the hands of Emperor Nero, and he had outlived every one of the other apostles. Tradition tells us that John was the only one that was not martyred for his faith, but not because they didn't try. Uh, one of the early church fathers tells us that when John wouldn't quit preaching, that they dragged him into the arena to execute him by means of throwing him in a, a vat of boiling oil. And then when he didn't burn and they pulled him out unscathed, they didn't know what to do with him, so they exiled him to the island of Patmos. Okay. Let's put ourselves in John's shoes. So he's pretty much a kid when he starts to follow Jesus. He sees miracle after miracle. He watches as Jesus is crucified. He rushes to the empty tomb and he sees the resurrected Lord go back up to heaven. He is thrilled to see the movement of the church and he moves to Ephesus to assist these growing house churches that are popping up all over the city. And for 20 to 25 years, he's just ministering. He's just doing his thing. And then all of a sudden, as an old man, I mean, he like doubled the life expectancy for the average Jewish man during this time period. As an old man, all of a sudden, he decides it's time to write some letters. Why? That's a really good question, because during this time period, we don't have any major archaeological evidence that suggests that Christians in Ephesus were being persecuted. They were in some other pockets, but not in Ephesus. Ephesus was a very, very large, very cosmopolitan kind of anything goes kind of city. Um, so why, there's no persecution going on. Why would John write these letters? Well, as you read it, you're going to find something very interesting. It's not because people outside the church were trying to destroy the Christian faith. That was happening. It just wasn't happening there. It's because people inside the church were trying to improve it. It was coming from inside the church. So what do I mean that they were trying to improve it? Okay, if we're going to understand the letters of John, we need to understand a way of philosophy called Gnosticism. Gnosticism comes from the Greek word gnosis, which means knowledge. And the Gnostics believed that they had like a, like a special enlightening, okay? They believed they had this special secret knowledge. They had been spiritually enlightened and that only those who knew the secret handshake and gave the secret word, only those who joined their specific belief system could have this secret knowledge. And and they were going around teaching the Christians about this new and special knowledge. So Gnostics believed that everything in the material world, and we see plenty of this today, by the way, Gnostics believed that everything in the material world was bad, like 
Body, bad. Matter, bad. Physical world, bad. Spiritual, good. Okay, that was the Gnostic way of thinking, that if it was spiritual, it was really, really good. But if it was physical, it, we didn't have to worry about it because it was just going to pass away. And it was, you know, this is temporal. Spiritual is eternal. Is that right? Yes, but... Yes, but what we do in the body has exceedingly great implications on our spiritual condition, right? It does. It just does. We know this to be true. And so these early Gnostics, this is so funny, they, they believed that a God would never become a man and, ensue, and, and assume all the indignities that came with being human. So Gnosticism took the doctrines of Christianity and just sort of wove Gnostic thought through it. So this is what they believed. They believed that Jesus was real. He just didn't have a body. It looked like he had a body, but it was just kind of like a, a phantom or an apparition or a hologram, okay? Phantom Jesus who looks really real. Now, this presents some really big problems for Christianity because what is our faith grounded and based on? Two things, incarnation, resurrection. The incarnation Incarnate comes from a Latin word, in meaning in, and carnate, carnal, flesh. It means in the flesh. So a, what do we celebrate every year on December 25th? Christmas, that Jesus actually fully God con condensed himself to time and space and entered into time and space in a body. And then what do we celebrate every Easter in April or May, depending on the year? Right, the resurrection. We celebrate the resurrection. So actually to say that Jesus never had a body kicks the legs out from underneath Christianity altogether. So how did they reconcile this? This is wacky. So they agreed that Jesus was a God or at least pretty God-ish, okay? They agreed that he had a divine nature. That was settled, and they also agreed that it appeared as though he were crucified. They just said it wasn't Jesus on the cross. Well, who did they think it was? Well, there's a guy in the gospel, his name's Simon of Cyrene, who carried Jesus's crossbeam when Jesus was too weak from the flogging. And so some of the Gnostics said it was him. <laughs> Most of them said it was just a demon shell body. Like just flesh with no real soul, just sort of like a, a demon puppet master, moving it around and making it look like it was really a body. Okay, so why do we need to know this? Because John's first letter, the entire thing, all five chapters is written to combat this very teaching. You're gonna see it in chapter one, verse one. That which was from the beginning, that which we have seen, which we have beheld with our own eyes, that which we have heard, which we have touched with our hands. What is John doing? He's like, he was real, I was there, he was real. So, so why is this a thing? I mean, like, I, I, I'm thinking through this and, and I'm thinking, all right, what, now, as long as we've got the divinity part, right? What did it really matter if that was or wasn't Jesus? Like, I mean, you know, what, so it looked like he had a body. Who cares? Well, it's a really big deal. Um, one of the things that occurred to me as I was preparing for this is that unless we have a really, really sound understanding of the gospel, John's letters aren't gonna make much sense. And we're, we're just never gonna get more than that deep. So to say Jesus wasn't a man in the flesh undermines the whole gospel. So what is the gospel? That's kind of one of those questions we were talking about this in our, in our leaders group beforehand. It's like one of those questions that we're all so familiar with the word that if someone says, so what's the gospel? We're all like, oh, it's, well, it's, uh, you know, the gospel, you know, I mean, it's, it's one of those things we're so, we're, we're so familiar with the word, but then it's like when you really get down and try to explain it, it's like, well, let me think about this. So the gospel is the good news of the kingdom of heaven. It is the kingdom of heaven come to earth, breaking through the darkness. That's the gospel. The gospel starts in Genesis. 
Uh, Genesis 1 and 2 tell this beautiful story about a creator God who created a people for the sole purpose of being an object of his affections and his blessing. Completely opposite of what every other religious system in the world has ever believed. I mean, they, they, typically, when you look at religions in the biblical times, they all believed that the gods were these wacky, far away, crazy people and, with superpowers, and that they like tore one goddess's body in half, half of Tiamat became heaven, half of her became the earth, and that's the creation story. We're the only religion that acknowledges that God created out of an abundance of his love and that he created us to be an object of his blessing. I can see that and I know I have to hurry. Um, Okay, God required one thing from the man and the woman. He gave them this perfect paradise. I mean, it's the most beautiful thing in Genesis 1. He has his brand new baby earth and he's like, here, it's yours. What do you think? And he's, he's just telling them everything he's given them. Dominion, lordship, you get to do this. And when you plant and grow, it's going to spring forth. I mean, it's just this beautiful, generous thing. And one rule, follow my way. Why? Because you're mean, God, and you're trying to keep things from us? No, because my way leads to life. All other ways lead to death. And so if man and woman could just follow God's way, everything would be fine. Did they? Nope, there's a sneaky snake in Genesis 3. We're not gonna go into it, but the man and the woman do things their own way. And when they do that, they break intimacy with the Lord. They break the fellowship that they had and it fractures the entire creation. And God immediately puts his plan into place that someday there is going to be someone who is going to slay evil and death forever and reconcile God's people back to himself. And you know what? I'll tell you the biggest reason. I believe the gospel because of all the proof that I I gave you earlier and because of a thousand other things. But you know why I really believe it? Because I think that deep down in our souls, we know that things are not as they are supposed to be. Deep down in the deepest recesses of our hearts, we know that we do not measure up to a standard of righteousness, not God's and not even our own, right? None of us can be perfectly good. None of us. None of us can get through a day without complaining, at least in our minds, at least in our minds. No one is kind all of the time. None of us do anything from purely pure motives. All of us at times are looking for ways to position ourselves to look better, smarter, wealthier, fill in the blank. None of us want our every thought displayed over our head the moment we think it, am I right? All of us have lied. All of us have portrayed a false version of ourselves to others. All of us have talked about people behind their backs. None of us are as generous or as hospitable as we could be. All of us lack discipline and self-control in certain areas. And all of us think a bit too highly of ourselves in other areas. All of us have secret prejudices and all of us have rooted for others to fail at times. We cannot be as good as we know we are supposed to be. And that is really bad news. David wrote this, Psalm 14, one through two. The Lord looks down from heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good, not even one. No one in the history of history has ever been able to stand before God in righteousness. None of us. None of us can stand before God in our own strength because God is absolutely perfect. He is the essence of perfection. He's perfect in beauty, perfect in glory, perfect in wisdom, perfect in strength. He's perfect in justice which means that no injustice can go unpunished. But there's a problem because God is also perfectly merciful, 
which means it is who he is and it is his very nature to pour mercy out. And that creates a very big tension because what do you do when perfect justice meets perfect mercy? How do you handle that? What happens is we need someone who can stand between us and God. None of us, and it says so in scripture, can stand before God as he is and live. We'll sizzle up. We just, we can't stand the glory. So we need an advocate who can stand before God in the heavenly realms, which means he's gotta be divine. He's gotta be sinless. He's gotta be blameless but we also need a representative. If you've ever been in mediation, you know a mediator is there to mediate between both parties. He's gotta have both parties' interests at heart. So that means our representative needs to be one of us. And so if he's gotta be a perfect advocate and a perfect representative, he's gotta be perfectly God and he's gotta be perfectly man. So what is God going to do? Well, fortunately, God exists as a trinity. That means three in one, tri-unity. Our God is three in one. He is God the Father, God the Son, God the Spirit. And John tells us this in his gospel, for God so loved the world, you can just go ahead and put your name in that blank, God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Sin has to be punished but God is perfectly merciful. So God the Son stepped off the throne into skin, climbed on a cross, and absorbed his own wrath over our sin. Took the punishment for every injustice, every harsh word, every atrocity, every wrongdoing, And for everyone who believes that he is who he says he is, he offers the gift of eternal life. And now we have a representative who lived and experienced every temptation we could experience, but did it perfectly. And now when he stands before God, he says, see her? Oh, she's mine. She's mine. And that's the gospel. And that's what the Gnostics are attacking. And John, the apostle who put his head on his Messiah's chest and listened to that heartbeat, isn't having it. He is not having it. So he wrote his letters to Christians living in and around Ephesus to warn them of this insidious false teaching that has sprung up from within them and to show them the nonsense of what they were teaching. So this is how the Bible study is going to work. I got you for eight more weeks. I'm so excited I can't stand it. Um, and so for the next seven weeks, we're going we're gonna to go through 1 John. Why? Because it's the biggest of the three letters. And because I mistimed and asked for nine weeks instead of 10, we are cramming 2 and 3 John into one night. Fortunately, they're very short. Each week in your workbook, you have reading and you have questions to answer. When you come back for the teaching, that's when we're going to go through the questions that you had in your homework. Now, I want, I'm want i just going to ask you a favor. You don't have to do it, but you'll get the most out of the study this way. I am going to ask my study nerds who have big fat study Bibles and who know all the commentaries, I'm going to ask you to hold off on reading those until after the teaching. Because what I want for you is I want for you to wrestle through this yourself because that is when we learn the most. And that's when it really sticks. It's not when we take a GPS to get everywhere. It's when we get a little lost and drive around and then find the way and we learn and remember the landmarks, right? So that's what I'm gonna ask you to do. Um, Whether or not you do the homework, honestly, y'all, I don't care. I just want you here. I just want to see you here. Some of you are going to do all of it, and then you're going to email me for extra. Some of you might get to one or two questions over the course of the entire study. I don't care. I'm I'm, I'm jealous for your mind, so I want you to do it because I want you to have that time with the Lord, but I just want you to come. 
I just want you to come and be with your friends and let us love on you because we're here to serve you. Um, what else do I have to say? I said that. I said that. Uh, do I need to tell them that you're breaking up into small groups? You're breaking up into small groups. And we're going to give you those names of where you're going. But first, I want to pray for you. Heavenly Father, we love you so very much. And Lord God, we just thank you for your word. And we thank you that we can trust it, Lord. We thank you so much that there's so much evidence that gives us the peace of mind that we have attached our cart to the right horse, Lord God. You are the only God who has ever pursued his people and then died for them. Who wouldn't want to know you, Lord? God, stir that desire and that passion and that fire in our hearts for you over the course of this next, um, these next few months. Speak to us every time we open the scriptures, Lord. May we develop deep and lasting friendships, Lord. And may we just rejoice in what you are doing um, in the hearts of, of us and of each other. We love you, Lord. We pray this in the mighty matchless name of Jesus and by the power of his Holy Spirit. Amen.